All right, ladies and gentlemen, welcome back to a very special episode of the BCP with the good brother, the editor in chief of thepopbreak.com. It's Bill Botkin. It's Bill, what's up, bro? How you doing over there, man? Doing great, Rob. It's a Friday, talking wrestling. Stay inside, staying healthy, man. It's ready to yeah. rock and roll. Damn positive. I love it. This is a big one for us, guys. Uh, so honored to have a few minutes to chat with uh, some pretty, ba- pretty major names in the business right now. Guys, please welcome to the show two gentlemen that are the collective heart and soul of WrestlePro. Uh, these guys are in-ring talent, promoters, producers, trainers, and actors, respectively. Uh, guys, we're honored to welcome, and, and we're not worthy here, the iconic Mr. Pat Buck and Mr. Kevin Matthews to the show. Gentlemen, how are you? How's everything? Good. That's the first and last time anyone's ever used the word iconic uh, yeah. near, near our names. So ever, I'll take if it. You, if you ever need to feel good about yourself, just have a conversation with Rob. Oh, very yeah, cool. You guys are officially my favorite uh, people I've ever done a interview podcast with at all outside of Pat. Call me iconic. Massive wrestling names of business. Dude, I'm here like, yeah, yeah, keep it going. I didn't want that intro to stop. I just wanted to be like, yeah, come on, give me yeah. some more. <laughs> uh, we take care of you guys here, and we appreciate a few minutes. Uh, first and foremost, uh, how are you guys making out in this crazy world, this crazy quarantine? How's the family? Everyone staying healthy over there? I guess so. I mean, it, it's, I'm in Queens, so it's, it's pretty, it was bad. Everything's a lot better. It's just waiting for everything to reopen, you know, yeah. um, bored to death. Uh, but trying to, you know, trying to make the most of it probably, um, spend a, way too much time sitting around and just working out and hoping that things open up sooner than later, you know? Yeah, Absolutely. Same here. Just sitting. I'm literally just working out. I dropped thirty pounds, close to thirty pounds uh, since I've been in quarantine. Working out daily at home and stuff like that. I'm safe. Uh, my friends, family. I've been very fortunate and stuff like that. I go to on Facebook though. It seems like it's turning into bad news. I don't like looking at the feed no more because it seems like a lot of people are being affected that are close to me, and it seems like that circle is getting closer and closer. So I hope this whole thing passes before any more damage is done. Yeah. yeah. You ain't wrong, but it's good to hear you guys are working out. You know, Kev, I saw some of your pictures the other day, man, looking looking good over there, putting in the work. Uh, and also, you guys kind of started the Pat Buck Show. Tell us a little bit about where that idea came came from. Very unique. Well, I don't know if you've heard, but I, I got a little bit of free time now, you know, outside <laughs> of quarantine. I, I don't really have a whole lot of work responsibility at the moment. So, uh, or maybe I do, I don't know. But um, no, it's something, you know, what's really, to be honest, I wanted to start I love podcasting. I started podcasting with Kevin years ago when we had a show called Two and a Half Wrestlers. And then, like, I got out oh, of it. I didn't it know that was you guys. I remember that one. Uh, that was us. Yeah, we were yeah. very immature. I'd, pre- I'd, I'd prefer if we, you know, didn't acknowledge that we were them. But, uh, <laughs> yeah, I, I love podcasting. I tried it on my own, and I was too busy and too lazy to do all the work for it. I uh, had some good partners, had some bad partners. Anyway, like, I actually oh, – sorry. Uh, I was going to – I thought about bringing it back earlier this year when I was on the road with WWE just because I had access to everybody. Not not really so much WWE superstars, but like just everybody. And I was going to make it a, a, a thing to go on the road and find different people in different towns and interview them. Well, uh, plans kind of changed. So now that I'm kind of home and uh, no longer with WWE, I thought it was cool to just promote our up and coming stuff. And, um, you know, I still got the training schools. We got the promotion. And it's just something I kind of like enjoy doing. So we started back up and it's been rolling ever since. Awesome. That's good to hear, man. And uh, KM, I'll throw it over to you, man. We, we shouted you out a couple times on the podcast. You know, we're in this, this crazy world, us creatives, us performers. I feel like we feel some sort of obligation to kind of help in these crazy times. And you've done a fantastic job um, doing some food drives and, and just providing for people. What was kind of your mindset behind that? Well, that's when it first, uh, started i mean i don't think anyone anticipated you know fast forward to where we are at now with you know the death rate and everyone's quarantined for months now and i I don't think no one i thought everyone myself included thought this would be a couple of week thing we'd nip it in the bud and so i kicked off the food drive as soon as this thing started i'm like well you know you know a lot of families out there probably they're gonna be out of work for a couple of weeks so uh this would help out and we donated 759 pounds of food and um but i mean like fast forward to what it is now, it's much bigger than that now, but there's a lot of obviously bigger places that are helping out with massive food drive and donations and stuff like that. And uh, so, yeah, I mean, it was just my way of 
for something that I thought wasn't, because I never lived through something like this, that would be very small and not turn into what it was to try to help out as much as I can. And I wish even right now there's something bigger I can do, but I guess just doing my part, you know, staying social distancing, quarantine and stuff like that is where we're all at right now. But yeah, it was just me trying to help out and credit to all of uh, our Russell Pro guys that contributed and some fans actually that couldn't even make it, don't were con- very generous with their donations and I went to the supermarket got some stuff and yeah I mean we it's not the first time we've done stuff like this we've, we've taken part in stuff in Rahway a bunch I know Pat and Hawk over there they do the the toy drive in New York I mean we always try to have our hands and stuff even when we lived in Rahway Pat was always going into the the local town hall meetings and stuff trying to be part of the city and stuff so we always go one step above I mean not taking jabs at local promoters and stuff like that but we always try to do more than just running a, a quick little show and stuff. try to get everything involved and as much people as we can and charities and sponsors. And we just try to make it bigger than like as big as it can be and involve as much people as we can. And if you feel a lot of feedback that we get from our shows and whatever, a lot of people will say things like that, um, that what you call the experience they had and thank you so much. And, we just we just try to involve as much as we can and help out as much as we can because deep down, no matter what other people say, the ones that really know us, we're actually really good people deep down inside. <laughs> but if you're a piece of garbage, then we'll be one right back to you. <laughs> That's right. No, That's but great job out of you guys. Question ahead, for you guys, with like you guys saying, a lot of the downtime you have right now, you know, working out. I'm sure the time off helps the body heal and whatnot. But take us into the mindset of say we get back, say we have shows. In September, we're going to have this mm-hmm. Alaska show. Talk about, like, the mental, like, uh, awareness of your body to in the wrestling. Is there going to be a lot of ring rust? Like, you, t- you look at people, like, with athletes, you say they've been on the sidelines. They haven't been able to work for X amount of months. How do you, one, prevent injury? And, two, how do you get your body reacclimated? And especially, maybe it's good advice for the young guys you guys are training who now have been off rhythm, you know, wrestling training for three months, if not more. Well, you know, uh, a really good question because we kind of went through that maybe last. So even though we're in quarantine, I do own a wrestling school and I will selfishly agree that I've gone there with a couple of my students and wrestled a little bit just to keep our, you know, selves in shape. So um, but like last week, we actually had a a secret session with myself and Kurt Hawkins and a couple other guys. Mm. And uh, we we did an all out practice where, you know, a couple drills here and there. Right. And we, we felt like the walking dead after, you know, it was, uh, I, I almost threw up in the ring after I was really exhausted and I know he was hurting for a few days. So I really do. I think uh, time off is a wrestler's like worst friend. It's, it's not good for you because I think our bodies get calcified and, um, now I feel great. So I'm, I'm, I'm still getting my wind back, but bumping around, I'm good now. But um, it, it takes a little bit. So everyone that's taking so much time off, when they get in the ring, it's going to be rough to adjust. But I recommend anyone that's going to start getting out there, you know, I assume we're going to have training academies open before there's possible live events or, right. you know, wrestling shows. So I would recommend, I hope that uh, wrestlers out there just don't hop back in the ring. I would hope that they go get a couple training sessions in or bump around just before they – you know, have a show. So it, it's tough. But, you know, th- when I was younger, when I was 20, I can just go in the ring, not stretch out. Now I'm 36. It's, uh, I got to stretch out and it takes a little bit more while to recover. But once you get in the groove, you're fine. Or at least I'm fine. When you said, uh, I kind of laughed to myself because you said, well, what do you do to prevent injury? I said, I'm trying to figure that out. And uh, <laughs> I'll let you know when I find that one out real quick. So, uh, but uh, no, everything that Pat said and that training session you talked about, I was invited to that, but waking up that early and I was like, yo, there's no way. I know there's no full steam ahead. And no, I, so I kind of openly admit that I dipped out on that one. My ride dipped out, but I could have went. But I was like, yo, dude, I'm going to die over there because I'm a little bit more fragile than these guys. And it's funny, too, because they've had 10 times more matches than I have. And I don't – I my body's 20 times more brittle. Maybe it's the size differential. I have no idea. But Yeah. So I'm very cautious, but um, yeah, I mean, oh, I'll openly admit, my wind has never been great in the ring to begin with, but uh, <laughs> I get by. I, I, you know what I mean? I do a yeah, lot of I, control, I get by, but sometimes 
with this layoff, because keep in mind, I was already laid off prior to this uh, quarantine thing. I did the one show in Alaska, Team Wafala and stuff, because I was really right. banged up. Even coming off of Impact, I said to myself, I said, I'm going to take a substantial amount of time because I didn't re-sign with them. They didn't offer it. Nothing was on the table. They were still booking me on events when I was out of contract. And I pulled right. off of the event um, after my contract was up. And I said, dude, I'm really mangled. Like, they said, what do you want? I said, I can't, I'm not going to make it to this taping. Like my body, like my body was shutting down at that point. Like I was limping. I couldn't walk. Like it was that bad. And I was like, yo, I'm at the time I was what, 32. I'm 37 now. I was like, this is bad. Like I need to fix this because like, it's, I'm not, I, I'm not going to, I'm going to wind up in a freaking wheelchair if I keep going at this pace. So I need to kind of pull back and reassess the situation. So then I just kind of dipped into just, I did a couple of shows that last year. This year, what did I forget? In 2019, right? Uh, and and then uh, I said to myself, I was like, I'll run shows, and then my goal was always get in shape, get in the best shape possible, and see how what's your call we could fix because you like my knees, especially those are the main problems with these. My yeah. especially my knee, but my knees are shot, so yeah, I'm bone on bone. And then I started looking into stem cell work in Colombia, where all the guys have been going and stuff right. like that. And, insane results with Rey Mysterio wrestling like he's in 1996 again it's just insane like uh yeah. like I, I already went through the process sending them my MRIs having con conversations on the phone and going over numbers yada yada and originally it was going to be June it was going to be next month I was supposed to go out there yeah. you know in a couple of weeks realistically to get the work done but uh obviously that all fell through with what's going on so that's still on the table. I still plan on getting that done. But as I launched, so then when I knew that wasn't happening, it's like, okay, so what do you, what can you do before you do that? Lose weight. Lose weight. I looked online and said every one pound of body weight is four pounds of pressure on your knees. I was like, okay, if I drop like 30 pounds, that's 120 pounds of pressure off my knees. That would probably alleviate a lot of the, you know, and did. I started doing a lot of deep yoga and dieting and stuff like that. And I dropped the weight and I noticed a significant difference. I was like, so we're, we're headed in the right direction. And then my ultimate goal is to go out there and get that work done. But right now, right this second, I mean, compared to the last year I was at Impact, I feel like a new person. The Taking that all that time off and now recovering, losing the weight, doing the workouts, the yoga, this, that. Uh, yeah, it's been, it's been life-changing stuff. So now I'm super excited, especially if I get the stem cell work done. I really think that I'm going to feel like I'm 20 years old again as time goes on. So I'm super excited. But right this second – I mean, not only do I look better than I have in a long time, not trying to put myself over, I, I feel, I feel so much better. So I'm super excited for when the world opens up and get my ass back in the ring. That was always the plan. People kept saying I retired. I never retired. Never retired. Never used the word retired. No in one ever. Years. No one retires in wrestling, right? No, I never said it though. Hawkins said I, I retired 27 times. I never retired. <laughs> I never once. I said I get lazy and fat and unmotivated. I don't retire. <laughs> hmm. God oh bless. man, um, that the, that's that's good to hear though that you're putting in the work, man. And uh, Pat, you mentioned uh, Rus uh, Creative Pro rather. Um, how proud are you of are you of that and the products coming out of it? Uh, you know, names like MJF, uh, Chris Statlander, who I just think is the sky's the limit. We had a great interview with her uh, over in Rahway, one of the most interesting interviews we ever did. But she's just phenomenal. How how proud are you of you? Uh, are you of all this accomplishments and all these great people coming out of uh, Creative Pro right now? It's it's great. You know, there there's it took a not like it took a while, but um, you know, I've been training guys since two that and girls since 2012, and um, you know, for a long time it was kind of hoping who see who can make it to a national platform. We have great students, and um, a lot of them, you know, haven't really. You know, maybe not have found their platform yet where they have the skill set to be on a national scale. But the ones who really rose to the top was MJF and, and Kristen. Um, but I think that within the next couple, you know, years or so when things open up, I think um, there's a lot of up and comers from both schools that can, you know, really do a lot of good work. But I'm proud. You know, it, it's cool to see that like, oh, yeah, like I were. You know, I remember their first days or, you know, they they still hit me up for, you know, advice or critiques and you know it's kind of a paternal type relationship with them so i just that's thought awesome. that you're talking you said chris statlander the sky's the limit the sky's the limit for the alien i, just I was thinking the same thing uh, <laughs> there it is the, the, the galaxy yeah but no she's uh, phenomenal there's so many great people coming out of there um 
Real, real quick, gentlemen, uh, let's get some shameless promo out of the way here. I saw a couple days ago you guys announced the September 19th show in Alaska. First and foremost, I do have some fan questions. I do want to be respectful of your time. But first and foremost, how did you guys make that um, decision to have that show in Alaska in this crazy time right now? I'm all for it. <laughs> Are you guys going to go? I'm, th- I'm thinking about making plans, man. I'm not lying. <laughs> all right. I'm high risk, so I got to say no. Gotcha, gotcha. Well, Alaska right now is 100% open. Oh, so, that's interesting because wow. East so, Coast, we don't hear too much about Alaska these days. So the game plan was we had the show in May. May, thir- May 9th was the show with DDP and all these guys on it. And then as we got closer and we realized then Alaska starts shut down with the rest of the world, they were one of the last who shut down and they shut down. I was like, this ain't happening. So then I spoke to the building and I said, what, what can we, what, what do you think? Should we do August? He's like, well, no, I would suggest September. I said, okay, let's get a date in September. And then he came up. They said, you have this option, this option. I said, all right, let's take that September 19th and let's see where we go. And then we played it out as a little time trickled on and stuff like that. I loosely promoted it. I, I was keeping all the fans on the Russell Pro Alaska Facebook page informed. And I said, um, what's going to call it? Here's the thing. The show's obviously not happening, but – you want a refund, go to each point of purchase and they'll refund you or you could hold those tickets and then transfer it over to September 19th. You want to know what's crazy? Because I get the breakdown. Not yeah. one fan got a refund on that show. Not one fan requested a refund. That was the most insane thing I've ever seen. Like I was expecting the numbers to kind of go dip down and fluctuate a little. Like the numbers stayed exactly the same from the moment before. Now they're starting to rise again. So, um, but it, I thought that was amazing. That just goes to show their drive and passion over there is insane. Like, they're like, dude, there's no other wrestling. Like, we're not giving up our tickets. Because <laughs> um, it's the same stuff. Different venue. They own two conventions. They own the arena. Then they own the, the Egan Center, which was booked September 19th. But then they own the, I don't even know how to pronounce the name, Denaya Den- 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 Center, I think it's pronounced. Uh, they own that, which is a block away. And it's the same exact layout. It's a big convention center and same seating and all the tickets transferred over. And like, OK, but then when the state was 50 percent open, I was like, OK, this is going to happen. And then yeah. when 100 percent and they said the building told me, they're like, dude, this is full steam ahead. The bars, everything's opening here. I was like, dude, so let's rock and roll. Let's promote the hell out of this. I reached out to Dallas DDP and I said, dude, it's 100 percent open. Uh, I'm going full steam ahead for September. Are you in? He said, I'm in, brother. And I was like, okay, so now by one, the guys, the AEW guys are waiting on confirmation for, to, to come over that we're on the May show and then um, just announcing them as they confirm. And a couple of adi- auditions, we announced Kurt Hawkins is now a part of that. Yeah. He's a close friend, obviously, of ours forever, so that was expected. And um, maybe another surprise or two. And yeah, that's that's the game plan. I mean, they're super stoked out there. And like I said, as of yesterday, tickets started spiking up again and more tickets. I was like, this is this is so it's it's at least fun. I mean, it sucks that we can't have our Jersey shows and stuff, because especially fall is big for us in New Jersey with the railway shows. Like we always hit big with, you know, September, October, November, December months. But um, it's it's just good. I also have December 5th on stamp on, on hold as well for a return to Alaska. So it's just fun that we have a a show because it felt so weird the last couple of months with nothing. This is the first time in 20 years where I have nothing to look forward to. It's just like in purgatory. Like it's just, I don't know what the hell's going on. Like I'm just floating around doing nothing. So it's now great that something's solidified, confirmed, the contracts are signed with the building, the venue, tickets are flying now and everything's, everything's a go. And it's just feel my normal is slowly starting to come back. So. That's great to hear. Where can people get uh, tickets and all that stuff uh, for the show? Uh, if you go to Russell Pro Alaska Facebook page, all the links are on there. It's a Ticketmaster outlet. But, I mean, if you want to keep it simple, the page is slightly outdated, but the link still works. i got to get that updated. RussellProAlaska.com. If you just click the, the old flyer for the May show, it still redirects you to the Ticketmaster link. So, or you just go to Ticketmaster and put in Russell Pro Alaska. I mean, it's the only thing. That's Pat, that makes when, we, sense. when we talked back last year during Mania Weekend, uh, you, mm-hmm. in, in regards to Alaska, you were talking about how much of a big gamble it was because obviously East Coast guys going to the other side of the country and you know the other side of the world to run a wrestling show, and he said this is a yeah. big gamble. We're willing to do it because you were saying how much Kevin sold you on Alaska and there's no shows. Talk about the reception. I mean, we're so spoiled here on the East Coast with so many promotions. Talk about the reception that you guys have gotten from Alaskan wrestling fans and what 
what it's like running a show up there. I mean, I've heard some of the audio from Colt, which was pretty cool. Uh, mm-hmm. But, you know, fill us in on what it's like out there. I mean, I mean from my... I what? Say, I said, you want, you want to jump in first? Good. Yeah. I mean, from my experience, it was, uh, you know, obviously they don't, you know, not just with wrestling, from, from what I hear, you know, not a lot of entertainment as, entertainment acts, you know, find the time to go to Alaska or want to do the travel, et cetera. So, uh, you know, I think our first show, what was it, 1,400? Was that, was that the number? I think 13, 1301 or oh, 1302 was the official number on the paper. Big. So in, for an indie show, it's great. I mean, the arena was way big, but it still was – that that crowd was pretty passionate. I mean, I got I was lucky enough to uh, to close the show that night, and you know I just got the energy from that crowd that they, you know, it, you could always feel at the end of an independent show or or any show in particular when the crowd gets tired or when it's gone too long, and you know it was one of those things where on most shows when you know the show's over everyone just leaves, and they knew we were the last match and they knew that the show was over. And, like, nobody wanted to leave. Nobody wanted to go home. Everybody just wanted to hang out and just, like, still not admit that the show was over. So that was kind of a cool <laughs> feeling that, you know, it was like, hey, normally I'm used to, like, whatever the main event happens, everyone's running towards the parking lot. It wasn't like that. It was everyone was going just eternally grateful. It, it was a really great experience. That's awesome. So uh, to add to what he said, too, is the game plan going into that first one was – let's see if we could do this. And it's a one and done deal. It was never an intention on turning this into a full-time thing. It was just like a one off deal. The decision to do it a second time was made the day of the show before doors open. Wow. When I, Oh, Pat, I said, dude, do you want to get a return date to announce? He's like, yeah, let's do it. And I, I went right to the, the guy, uh, Darren that runs the arena. And I said, dude, I said, what can we get a return date? I, this is April. I said, this was April 20th. I said, what about October? Six months. From and he said, WWE has a hold on an October date here. He's like, and the contracts WWE has when they go there every couple yeah. of years, nobody runs six months before them or three months after them. Yeah, so Radiance clause, yeah. They said, they, said uh, they, they have a hold on, they wound up not fulfilling it. They, they've released the hold, but that's why they said, what about December? We could give you December. I said, uh, okay, so I took a December date eight months later, and um, that's the one we went back with Bret Hart. And again, it's a, it was a big learning process. Everything he said with the fans, the fans there, I love all wrestling fans. They're a different. They're a bit of a different. You'll have your, you know, fans that I had to block off the page that like they say stupid things. But for the most part, ninety something percent of them, the word the word that they kept using over there is appreciate. Like which kept caught, catching me off guard. We appreciate you coming. We appreciate. Thank you. We appreciate it. Some of the some of the fans were going up to the merch table and giving the guys twenty dollars. For no merch. They're like, no, no, we appreciate you coming here. We know it's long here. Just put that towards your food and travel. I'm like, what? Who does that? <laughs> that didn't even make sense to me. So, uh, what do you call it? Anyway, so it just it just blew my mind with that. Uh, and the first show, the first show, we didn't get rich, but we, we turned a profit enough to make it seem like there, there might be something here and stuff. And again, I overshot it. My thought process is, dude, we could run this arena. There's no wrestling here, blah, blah, blah. We'll bring in a couple of big names. We might pack this arena. I don't know. Like, I looked up the numbers. WWE drew 5,500 people in, you know, 2017. They drew uh, 5,000 people in 2013. And and I looked at, I, I saw a list. WWE ranks their arenas, like, that they run in. I found a list online where they give it, like, letter grades, where the, the, the good arenas, I like, with ticket sales and stuff like that, like get the letter A and then it goes A minus B sure. and stuff like that. And Alaska was ranked, that arena was for them is ranked on the list at like A minus, like one of their higher arenas that they like going to because it's well. So I was like, I did my I did my research and stuff and I was fortunate enough to find a couple of people over there, build a team, like send after the April show, a guy JT West, great guy, opened up a wrestling school because of the show. He had one a long time ago, but he's an old Memphis wrestler. Great dude. Now he That's wound familiar. up then he uh, wound up starting like three students. Now he has, I think he has like 20 now. And uh, I have a deal with him where I'm going to feature a couple of um, his students on the show in a student match. So it's almost like they're not a creative pro wrestling school, but they're the unofficial school of Russell Pro Alaska. Like he, we use his ring. I'll showcase his students. Like as far as like runners go, like we have our students here doing errands and flyering and stuff. We have his students over there. They built an actual team um, over there with 
it, by by dumb luck. No, it, none of this was supposed to happen. We were going to run this damn show and run commercials and go in blind for the most part. It was going to be terrifying. And then one by one, this team started building because not only are the fans passionate, all of the people that were involved in wrestling once upon a time or in a smaller level, they're all like, hell yeah, let's make this a thing. And, and, it's, and, it, and it's really good. So the first show we did something. The second show, I'll openly admit, I lost money. The show, we didn't, I mean, you know, I didn't have to sell a kidney to pay it off. We didn't go flat broke, but uh, it didn't turn a profit. But then I was like, okay, we brought in Bret Hart. It's a whole formula that any promoter has to figure out, even when you're running in the smallest place or the biggest place, whatever state or country, right. you have to figure out what works because not everything is the same. And my thought is, Bret Hart would be bigger than Foley and more people and stuff. That wasn't necessarily the case. We drew a little less with Bret. So now I figured it out. I dumbed down the arena. You know, I'm, I'm selective on flights, less flights, less budget, so forth, so on, and stuff like that. And really? happy to say, heading into September, this show is is already on pace to be a smash. So uh, I think it's figured out. And a lot of people think that we have some huge, crazy money. Because if you look at this, if you look at it from the outside, you're like, they have something that they're not telling people. There's some weird money guy over there, or they <laughs> some some trust fund babies. Like we we've said it a million times. It's it's not like when the show made money, me and Pat made money. When the show lost money, me and Pat lost money. <laughs> it's, it, 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 it's not it's not some magical recipe. It's just a ass idea that I came with after visiting a place that I always wanted to go to. That was on my bucket list from when I was a child. And then I was like, let me see if I can pull this off. And now Pat's involved. And it, I, I, I bought the LLC to Russell Pro Alaska to make it a full-time thing. I would love in the perfect world to go there four times a year, every three months with one show backing the next, building an army of fans out there where just like we have in Rahway, we announced yeah. the next show, boom, done. You know, if we're if our if our if our attendance there is a thousand fans, okay, we're gonna work with that, and that's what we could do, and we can make it very profitable, and we could bring over a lot of the boys that never been there before, and it's a bucket list for them, and because we are for the boys as well. But if you've done bad business with us, or we're a little bit of a dick to me at some point, then ain't gonna happen, bro. Right. That was my long answer. <laughs> um, I wanted to ask you guys. Um, it's interesting. We're talking about Alaska. I believe that we talked to uh, Dion Rusman, the Iceberg, uh, one of our favorites at WrestlePro. How do you guys kind of um, acquire these different talents? And, and we'll talk about the Patreon where fans can kind of help out a little bit. Uh, that's super interesting. I want to talk about that in a little bit. But, uh, you know, we go to a WrestlePro show and there's something so special about it. We'll, we'll see someone from the Dark Order. Um, we'll see a lot of Creative Pro talent. We'll see people from Alaska. How do you guys kind of make these decisions? Oh, um, man, like those are pretty like those, all those decisions would require, you know, trying to, everything is like a big puzzle. Yeah. You know, we, we, and it's been over the last couple of years, you know, when I started promoting in 2012, um, it was easier back then because there was more things to book and, you know, we could, you know, just starting out, you know, sometimes we bring in a really big star just for the autograph signing, whether it be, you know, a flair, a Foley, a Brett, a Muda, whatever. Over the years, we got kind of away from that, which I prefer, where we, you know, started using, you know, talent that could really go in matches. Um, and that hopefully had some TV appeal. And I know a lot of independent places don't really necessarily maybe care about that, but we always did because I think if you're going to, if you, if you have a, our posters, we take a lot of pride in, and if you see our posters, you you should be able to recognize some names. That's the goal, at least, to have someone who, oh, I know that person. I'll go see them. Because if you don't have that, you're not really going to have much of a show. Um, over the years, it got more and more difficult because more companies started opening up and a lot of contracts were exclusive. So a whole pool of things we'd book from went away. And it got harder and harder. And then it, it came through a time period where we really couldn't really – Every now and then we'd get someone who fresh off TV, but for a, a while, you know, WWE didn't really let go of anybody for a long period of time. There, I mean, here and there, but there wasn't any, you know, back in, you know, five, six years ago, you kind of expected it a little bit more. It happened more often. Right now, we're like re not recreating history, but like we're reproaching, approaching like a new 
playing field where there's all this talent is available again. So it's going to be really interesting with that. But, you know, people come up, you know, whether they be local people we've known for a while that can go. We, we try to we book around our guys because our guys are our guys and they're going to be there. And we try to see what make the best matches, what what fits for this. Um, there's always going to be a, a push pull with like, you know, getting more people on. You know, it's a thing we always have to fight because everyone wants to be out of Wrestle Pro and Creator Pro. I probably run about 30 shows a year, and Rawway's our baby, so everybody wants to be on it. So we got to figure out a way to, to not get everybody on, but figure out a way to reward those or whatever the situation may be. You know, Dion's an uh, inter- interesting case. He started making like a face, uh, not a Facebook, uh, a social media kind of uh, calling for to get on the first Wrestle Pro show. And I, I saw it right away, and I was familiar that he was a you know Seth Rollins student, and um, yeah. you know as time went on, it, I think it just became, eh, maybe we should book this guy. Like, why not? It's like he's he's from there. Let's just book him. And then he became to a regular in New Jersey as well. A question in regards yeah. to that, like, you were mentioning some of the contracted guys. Now we we see mm-hmm. people in AEW, Impact, MLW have, you know, they're not exclusive. They can work on the independents. <laughs> is there any sort of Maybe this is a little too inside baseball, but is like, is there any sort of like politics you guys have to deal with, and you don't have to be specific of? Well, you know, this guy's on this TV show, or this guy, this woman's on this TV show. She can't lose, and can we put can we put our person against them? Is there any stuff you have to go with that, or or just is the wrestling world a lot less political than that? No, it's all political. It's, well, it's, there and, you anyone, go. <laughs> and anyone says it's not, you know, and by politics, it's not always like people trying to cut, cut each other's throats. But to, to be perfectly honest, a lot of a lot of wrestling is is your relationships with people and your friendships sure. or or, you know, most people, whatever company they're working for, they kind of have the, the tunnel vision that whatever happens in their company is the most important thing that happens on on the planet. So, like, yeah, we've had it. We've had issues. We've had people that have been super, you know helpful other companies have been very supportive but there's been times where like hey we can't you know you know uh we prefer if this happened or we've dealt with all sorts of issues and i'm used to it it normally doesn't come from the company a lot of times it'll come from someone's representation which really means it comes from the wrestler but it's it's just a fine it's just something that we're used to like if it's a legitimate call i'll give everyone the benefit of the doubt you know if they are trying to protect their career if I if I rightfully agree with it or if it's someone like on the up and up. Um, I understand certain things, certain parameters. Like I even explained this on one of my podcasts. You know, if Rusev started doing independence and he comes out to all these different promotions and he loses the first time, it doesn't feel right. It just wouldn't right. feel right at all. You know, but if you had someone like, you know, an Eric Rowan or a Drake Maverick or EC, or EC3, they could put people over and it would feel right. So there's a diff- there's a different thing, but like, what do you do if a former talent, you know, that you book on a show, yeah, I'll come in, but you know, I'm sorry, but I, I at the time I can't lose. So, so I, I don't I don't fight those battles really. I don't you know try to get in someone's head, like try to talk them out of it. I'll just avoid or be like, okay, well that's a, you know I, I respect that, but we're gonna have to move in a different direction if that's the case. Um, you know, I never try to go, oh, come on, or please, or, or do that. Uh, <laughs> most time, most of the time, I'll listen to the talent. I'll be like, okay, I'll make that work. But you've also kind of made an impression with me where if any sort of business happens in the future, I'm just going to note that. So it, it's just, it's part of the game, to be honest with you. Okay. See, as, as professional as Pat is and the way he talks, and even when he talks to talent, stuff like that, I don't want to say I'm the opposite, but sometimes he has to pull back because if someone's trying to talk to me like that, I'll literally turn around and be like, bro, are you serious? Are this is so fucking unprofessional. Who gives a shit if you lose? How do they talk like that? He's like, yeah, dude, what are you doing? You can't really do it. I was like, come on, man, dude, you're fucking gonna lose it. Dude, who gives a shit? It's like, come on, I'm a little bit of a loose cannon, but I'm but it's passion coming out because like at the end of the day, like I want to see everyone do good business. And like I'm not I'm also not that person where I'm not gonna bring in Tessa Blanchard as impact champion and be like, yo, dude, why can't you lose to our student Vicky Vicky? Like what, what, you have an ego? No, that's 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 not that's not reality. But if we bring in, let's say, a, a tag team that's just floating on the mid card somewhere on on Impact or MLW, that's that there's no they're not champions or they're not involved in nothing, oh we can't lose. Not saying it's happened, but I'm just using that as an example. Oh, yeah. Why? Why? And then a lot. Everyone will try to do the whole thing, like he said, the agent said, or the company said, I can't lose. Or it, the what happens a lot, especially with the bigger names, 
that we've used in the past that are well past their prime, they're just collecting pages, they feel it will hurt their stock, whether it be a singles legend or a tag team legend, it hurts their value. And right. I and I this person has the same uh, example. I always say Tommy Dreamer. I said, you could go to some backyard fed in the sticks of, I don't know, Idaho, where and Tommy Dreamer will put over, you know, the most out of shape, unathletic human being on the show. And then that promoter would be like, Dude, Tommy Dreamer is great to work with. There's a reason since mid '90s till 2020, Tommy Dreamer's booked two, three times a damn week, you know, at a pretty yeah. handsome rate, and makes a very good living. And everyone uses him all the time, but people don't think like that. They're like, "Well, no, if I'm going to come in there, I, I got to win. I got to do this." Like, nobody wants to do business with that person because if I'm running a company and I'm bringing you in one shot deal. Why would I want you to, unless it, it, the whatever I'm planning calls for it? Why would I want you to to go go up on one of my people that every single month, right. and you're not leaving after this? Like it doesn't make any logical sense. It's not good business. I mean, again, there's certain situations where it makes sense. Like if I if I'm bringing in some huge monster babyface name off of TV, and I have the biggest guy is jerk off heel and stuff like that he runs his mouth and the baby face goes up and something like that yeah i get it but for the most part like it's just good business all around and i'm not saying there's a lot of people like that but there's a lot of people that don't understand and they think uh right. i'm not gonna name names but they think that it hurts their value yet yeah, no you doing what you're doing now is hurting your value because promoters all talk and when we bring in somebody, I'll have five promoters say, how is that person to work with? I'm not going to lie and say, hell, you're awesome. Like right. Emma, I, we, when I put Emma against Scarlett, I went up to Emma and I knew her decently well. I was like, are you okay putting over Scarlett? She's like, in her Australian accent, I don't have a good Australian accent. She's like, oh, of course not. I don't give a damn. Absolutely. Absolutely. And then people have asked me, they're like, how was Emma? I was like, dude, Emma was great. Emma was great. I hope like, you did. I hope you put her over in the accent too. Yeah. So no. And, and again, word travels. I went to other promoters. I've messaged, you know, Dan over at MCW, Maryland MCW. Yes. He used a lot of, he has a lot of the, we, uh, we have the same structure. And I said, how is this person? Oh, this person. And he's honest. This person was great. This person was horrible. This person was this. This person wouldn't do this. And then he tells me, and I've used his advice that he's given me opinion on other people where I'm like, okay, I won't book this person. I won't book this person. So it does hurt. It does hurt you. Just I, for anyone listening to this, guys, you got to just do good business all around, man. Like, again, I'm, and I don't think we've ever been put in a position or we've been those guys where we try to go against it, where it's just like, listen, we know you're the champion here or we know you're getting a huge push on TV, but we need you to, you know, we're going to try to make you look like an asshole here. We, we've been pretty good at understanding and protecting talent we've been around between the two of us 40 years worth of experience we we're, we're talent as well as promoters and all this other stuff during your awesome intro you gave us and icons of so we get it. so we 100 percent get it so we'll always try to make it make sense and protect what needs to be protecting while doing good business all around we try our best but sometimes the card the just doesn't fall in our favor where it's just like this person just doesn't get it not saying we know everything but right. uh, we're, we're right more than we're wrong. I hear that. Absolutely. And guys, uh, I did want to talk about, now correct me if I'm wrong, I believe there is something with a Patreon where fans can kind of get their hands on this a little bit and help with the booking. I saw you guys talking about that online. Uh, what's going on with that? So the idea was, you know, restarting the podcast. I think, you know, I have a lot of stories or, or connections or whatever it may be with, you know, Everything wrestling, uh, training and running the promotion and my time this year with WWE and there's just a whole lot of stuff. But I think the mo the, uh, you know, a lot of podcasts find their success with different niche things. And I, I want to believe we're one of the only ones that really are full time promoters and, you know, running events actively and kind of one. I know there's a couple that may talk about stuff with right regards to the promotion, but really pulling back the curtain and allowing people through Patreon of our show, patreon.com slash show, to participate in seeing what goes into these booking meetings and, you know, uh, where we can have them on either Facebook Live or Zoom or Skype. And essentially, you know, me and Kevin will talk shop, but I want to get to a point where if we build this up and say we have, you know, seven or eight people that are on that specific tier, you know, we'll put it out there. Hey, we have a choice. It's between booking, you know, Heath Slater for this show or, you know, 
Chris Hero, who do you guys pick? And we'll acknowledge that. So part of it, we wanted to make it interactive and and just show people what um, on one of the podcasts I broke down kind of what goes into or planning a show in post post COVID world. But I think like even even on our next episode, we might sit down and break down how are we going to do Alaska? How are we going to budget it out? You know, how does or, you know, and we'll never give away finishes because I think that that ruins a show. That's oh, not yeah. up. You know, I, I I think it's fun to plan things and then watch them play out. But I'm not going to really have interactive things where someone tells me what, what the end of the match is going to be. Yeah, not going to do that. But as far as everything else, like um, if things get off the ground running, which I'm hoping for, and it may not happen this year or whatever, but we're going to have shows again. So um, the goal would be to, you know, approach different shows for different things. We might have a show that has a $5,000 budget that we need to bring in one established television name, had help us book the card or, you know, this is the storyline driven. This is where we were here. How do we get to here? This is where we, we think, what do you guys think? So just an interactive way that fans have never had. If you've, if you've ever wanted to be a chance to be involved with the booking of a promotion, this would be your opportunity. I almost blurted out my answer. Uh, he, Chris Hero, Heath Slater. So I was like, I hold back. Um, yeah, I, but I guess one thing, I guess with taking the curtains so far back, I mean, you guys were trained old school in a lot of ways. Like, does any of that rub against you the wrong way? Was it a hard decision to come up with that? Because, like, I know there is some magic, you know, behind the curtain. And I mean, or are we in an era now where who cares? It, it's all fun. It's, it's cool. We're in an era where Jim Cornette was on Dark Side of the Ring explaining people how we cut ourselves. Once I saw that, all bets are off. Oh, shit. That's so, right. did do that. <laughs> you know, <laughs> when I saw the king of the king of kayfabe kind of uh, take that direction, I've always – my personal thing, and I've, I've believed this for a while, is that, um, you know, I know wrestling, we came – obviously, it, 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 when they revealed it was predetermined in the 80s, whatever it may be. Right. Um, I've just always felt that we've been stuck kind of, oh, okay, now we know it's predetermined and, you know, maybe they're not really hitting each other full force or maybe they are. And, but like, since then we haven't really, yeah, we've had shows like tough enough. We've had diff- different things like that. My opinion, especially being a producer right, and being involved in so many things with wrestling, if people really knew what went into doing what we do from all aspects, from putting a match together, from, um, the physical training part of it to promoting and booking shows and experiencing all the problems and how to read an audience, how to, how to like what to do, what not to do. I think most people, if not all people would have a lot more respect for us. You know, I think that wrestling is kind of, you know, if you love it, you love it, but if you don't, nothing's good enough. But if, if someone took, pull the curtain back a little bit more. And I also think for those that kind of like it, if they knew more about, and I'm not saying backstage stuff, but if people really went, knew what went into um, putting a certain match together. And I, and if I break it down and really go, this is, you know, this is what's happening here that you subcon they're doing this because it plays on your subconscious here. And they're doing this for this exact reason. I think people would be like, Oh my God. And you respect people that we love watching a little bit more that's that's always my theory and i believe in it so yeah really interesting this is like uh you know we call it kind of like the reality era um just stemming uh, and i want to be respectful of your guys time just uh, stemming from a few fan questions here uh, all have is time that's all we have it's in today's yeah. age is time <laughs> I mean, it's like jail you, all all you have is time I <laughs> people out there that are really marking their walls <laughs> yeah you ain't wrong, man. You ain't wrong. Um, but we, we do appreciate it, guys. Um, fan question. I, I guess this is in terms of WrestlePro. Again, we don't have all the answers here. What is wrestling going to look like when the fans come back? I guess this would be in regards to WrestlePro, maybe Alaska. Um, do you guys kind of have answers yet? I know it's kind of tricky. I know you're still having the meet and greets and stuff, which is great for people like me. I like to support the talent. Uh, obviously, it helps me get interviews and stuff like that. Um, do you guys have a full game plan yet or just kind of going with the flow? I, I actually wrote today, I wrote, I wrote a reopening plan for my schools. I, you know, I, when the time's appropriate, I will do one for the promotion just to have it in front. But 
I think so many things can change before that beforehand. The first thing I'd need to know is what are the limitations of capacity per building? Yeah. You know, the Raleigh rec centers are home. We could fit, gosh, you know, we've had a thousand, we've had 1500. We've had, you know, if you pull back the wall, you could fit 2000, yes, but what, that. uh, yeah. What, what could, what could we realistically be allowed to do? Are we going to get 20%, 25%, you know, can we, can we run with 200 people? If that's the case, you know, I foresee, you know, two rows of chairs spaced out and bleachers. Everybody sits in a different spot. Maybe we can mark them. You know, I, I think as, uh, you know, I've bought machinery, you know, little little machinery that can disinfect the ring very quickly, just shoots over and stuff. It's pretty fast drying. So, you know, we're getting into that with the schools already, figuring out that stuff. But as far, my feeling is that this is going to be, I mean, I would love it if September we'd be allowed back. I think it's 50-50 that we're even going to have anything this year. I yeah. really do. But if they are, I'll be the first one to do it. And I'll figure out all the preca- precautions that we, you know, need to take. But And I'm just hoping that time that we're, we're all in a better place and, you know, everything's less, I don't know, germy. <laughs> yeah. Hey, going off that, like when you look at – you've already mentioned this with the Alaska shows, how well the ticket sales are doing. Do you guys feel that the – and I feel like I know the answer, but when you guys are like, hey, September 1st, we have a show. Do you feel like that's an instantaneous sellout because we've had nothing or do you feel like there are people who are going to be cautious because it's still the first time? I, I think uh, as – I think right now, up in because nothing. Even when I announced up, over a month ago, it was going to be September 19th, not one ticket moved from them to yesterday. I think everyone was still very cautious. But then when this, what the state then hit 100% open, and now they're like, okay, wait, this is happening again. Mm-hmm. I, I'm talking to my people out there. It's just the whole different world. They've had, uh, I think, right under 400 cases total out there. Because keep yes. in mind, Alaska social distance, <laughs> social distance other, mm-hmm. without trying. I mean, outside of Anchorage, you're, you're, the next neighbor is three mountains over, depending on what town you live in over there. Anchorage is still in New Jersey, which is also out. It's unlike New York, where, I mean, I lived in Brooklyn. I'm Brooklyn, born and raised. Pat lives in Astoria. I mean, you are literally all over everybody wherever you go, no matter what. So it doesn't surprise me that over in this area that it's so crazy high compared to somewhere over there. But I even my friend uh, Rain and Alecki that was – they basically do what I do in Alaska. They do it in Hawaii. They're the ones I wrestle for in Hawaii in October. So they they have a show lined up. I think it got pushed from June back to July. They're going full steam ahead with their show in July. I don't I don't know how open they are at 100 percent, but again, it's very Alaska and Hawaii are very similar to each other. I've been to both now. They're equally as beautiful and stuff like that. But they're going ahead with their show over there. Uh, I think I, I'm confident we're safe going into. Uh, in the September show there, to go back to your original question, I think fans are cautious, yes, but um, over there, I think I think once we especially trickle into June and towards and then hit July, it's just also a playing out thing. If stuff starts really dropping and then everyone starts their fears start lowering and life starts to slowly get back to normal, I think I think it'll uh, be business as usual. But over there, the clubs are opening, the bars are opening, like life is back to normal over there and i don't think again the, the stuff that they deal with those guys good they'll they'll drive in 27 feet of snow and like i mean they're <laughs> they're they're pretty ruthless over there i mean so but i think i think over there it's just a different animal that's why it's, it's so weird we run shows in new jersey and we run shows in alaska and i we're literally going to the place that's already fully open and the other place we run our main shows in is going to be the last place open, so it's it's pretty it's pretty crazy when we think about it. Yeah, so we're on both sides of the spectrum here, literally and figuratively. Yeah, yeah it's crazy, but uh, we we do appreciate you guys, um, you know, having a show. I got really excited when I saw that Alaska show coming out, and uh, I want to thank you guys personally for taking a few minutes to talk to us. Uh, Wrestle Pro is something really special every time you go to Rahway, just the mix of talent there, the up and comers, uh, the special attractions that you bring in. Uh, it's always been a good opportunity for me to grow my journalistic career and have some great interviews. Um, so I appreciate you guys taking a few minutes to talk to us. And, uh, before we get out of here, more shameless promo, please tell us where everyone can follow you guys on social media, the podcast, all that good stuff. 
Sure. I mean, the podcast is every Thursday. So Pat Buck show on iTunes. Kevin's on it pretty much every episode. Uh, go, it's also on YouTube. So youtube.com slash Pat Buck show. Um, we got the Russell pro up Russell pro online. I mean, not really shouldn't promote that right now. because There's nothing else going on. Uh, I'm on social media, all different platforms as Buck never stops. Oh, that, my t- <laughs> that's all I got. Instagram and Twitter. I'm Superstar KM. Uh, yeah, there's the Russell Pro Online page, the Russell Pro Alaska.com page. I guess we can promote that because we do have uh, those shows are realistically coming up. And again, I don't know how far reach your uh, show goes if you have many Alaska fans. However, depending on where you are in the world, tickets at that time are relatively cheap. I mean, tickets are under 400 bucks out of New York, New Jersey to head there, and it's beautiful. There's nothing else anywhere. <laughs> Land in this area especially so i would highly recommend maybe you know instead of sitting around make the trip out there it'll be worth it you'll knock out two birds with one stone you'll get to see some good ass wrestling and then you'll get to see a place that you never in your wildest dreams imagine yourself going to and you'll very much appreciate it but uh yeah russell pro alaska on facebook russell pro on facebook superstar km russell pro alaska.com just support 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 the podcast pat buck show love it well, thank you guys so much again for a few minutes. Uh, like I said, I feel like we're turning a corner here. Uh, you know, just stay healthy, stay positive. Uh, thank you, gentlemen, for a few minutes and continued success moving forward. Thank you again. Thank you. Appreciate yeah. it. Thank you. Thank you. All right, guys.